thanks for everybody to join here for the last session and the last presentation of this uh, um, UHPC session on applications and developments. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, UHPC overlays, particularly, and uh, what's the progress in the US, where we have been, uh, what kind of types of overlays are out there, and what are really the key success factors to install a UHPC overlay, particularly from a contractor's perspective. And at the end, I'm going to wrap it up with a couple of projects that we've worked on, uh, one in the US and one from our European colleagues as well. As well, and I'm going to have a couple of videos, so I'm going to need our colleagues' help over here at the end. All right, uh, first, UHPC Solutions, who we are. I just want to put that clearly out at the beginning. We are a specialty contractor. We are not a material supplier. Um, we have a lot of experience of using different type of UHPC UHPCs. Um, we focus really on overlays. We do field cast connections as well, and link slab shock reads and other applications. Um, UHPC Solutions is a company that's made out of two contractors that came together and formed this company, UHPC Solutions. Uh, one is Basilico, which is a Long Island, New York, Long Island contractor. And the other one is Wallo, Wallo International, which is a Swiss contractor, um, came over here and has a lot of experience in Europe, particularly for UHPC overlays. Um, we do our services across the nation um, and we focus on ABC work. We do hydro demolition as well. And the service that we always offer is the mixing, placing, transporting and installing of the UHPC. Um, we've talked about UHPC already briefly, but what's very important for you uh, on overlay, you want to have a thixotropic mix. And that's what you're going to see later on uh, and a little bit better in the, in, in the videos as well. Um, and for the fixed topic mix right now, um, to be able to get the tensile properties in the industry, in the US, we've been using three and a quarter percent steel fibers in these type of mixes. What most people are used to are the self-consolidating mixes that we only use 2% steel fibers. But I'm referring to Dr. Grable's um, um, presentation this morning as well too, is the amount of percentage is not as important. It really comes down to that you meet the tensile properties that are required for the design. We're looking at the development right now from, uh, from uh, UHPC overlays across the um, North America. Um, it's been very popular in, in, the, in North America and the US. The very first field application of a UHPC was up here, was in Mars Hill, but that was a field, that was a precast girder. Um, but since then we've come a long way. There's a lot of applications, there was, uh, um, joint connections, but if we're looking at the overlay market particularly, it was kind of a little, it's, it's, it's really now, there's a big development happening. The very first one was actually in 2016, which was installed in, in Iowa. And, uh, and since then, you had one in 2017, 2018, 2019 was a bigger year um, where we have, there was four bridges that used the UHPC overlay, but I gotta say 2020 was a pivotal year, which was huge for UHPC overlays in the US. There was over 10 bridges that had received the UHPC overlay. Us as a contractor, we've done um, six or seven that year. And uh, also what's happening is there's more being installed at different states. Um, so it's now in Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Iowa, Rhode Island, Illinois, there was one. Um, and then 2021 was a little slower again in the overlay where the industry kind of resets. Um, there was, I was only aware of two bridges that used the UHPC overlay. Um, 2022 is going to be an exciting year again for the UHPC overlay market. Um, you're going to see the largest U.S. project. It's going to kick off that year, and I'm going to introduce it later on. Also, there was other projects that were bundled together, which is new to see as well. A state of New York, they did, for example, a project that was six um, bridges bundled together in an offering. But also, we're going to see... Uh, in Missouri, the first uh, non-proprietary UHPC installation to happen this year. Um, what type of overlays are out there? So basically there's one of them, which is very typical. This is the first one on the, on the left, which is uh, using it for waterproofing. Generally what you do is you remove an inch and a quarter, an inch and three quarters of, for the existing concrete, and then put the overlay on top um, and really give you an extended lifetime of that structure. 
Um, and then there's also many other applications that could be a structural overlay. If you need to increase the capacity of the deck itself, um, you can add, and that's what we've done off in Europe, they're adding a lot of rebars to the top, top in the overlay and get the structural overlay um, and improve the strength of the bridge. Um, how do they get finished? Um, there's two types of finishes right now that you see. One is with an asphalt riding surface that uh, that's more popular in Europe or in Switzerland. Um, for us in North America, we really want to utilize the durability of the UHPC and the riding surface gets either just grinding, but generally speaking, you get grinding and grooving together. And that gives you a really nice smooth ride as you drive across that bridge. What are the key success factors for a UHPC overlay? And that really comes down to six items um, that are critical to be able to be successful. First, for the overlay, it needs to have a proper surface preparation. Um, you need efficient mixing. The material supply of the material that must be consistent all the time so that the paving equipment or machine that you have continuously can go, there's no stop and goes. Um, the machine needs to be able to proper consolidate to achieve that bond with the uh, existing deck, curing, and then at the end to get a proper finish. Um, so all these six factors, they kind of vary from project to project because you really have to optimize your construction methods, uh, but they still need to be successful. Um, so we're talking about hydro demolition. Um, first, uh, most of the overlays that we did is that really specified like clear um, removal of the two to three, four in two to three inches of removal, depending on the project. It's excellent because for the hydro demolition, you know, what you can see is you really remove um, um, all the deteriorated concrete. Um, you get excellent bonding. You can see like here on the surface on, on over there, you can totally see the angles of the aggregate. It really comes out. Um, you have uh, peaks and valleys. You eliminate any micro cracks um, and it's fairly fast and quick. Now for many other projects and for other overlays, we're actually looking at removing it first in mechanical milling. Um, the reason being is because most of the bridge decks that you have out there have gone repairs over and over. You have many different, um, many different uh, repair materials on the deck, making it difficult for the ro robot to know what kind of strength is there. So by removing it with mechanical milling, the first um, inch and a half or so, um, you take care of that. And then you do a, a hydro scarification and to get that really beautiful uh, surface uh, to be able to bond the UHPC overlay on it. And then of course, before you apply UHPC overlay, always do SSD. Um, for mixing, there's different type of methods out there. Um, if we're looking, um, it, it really depends. The mixing is very important that you have high efficient mixing, that you get the material. And then it's always a trade-off that you have enough material or continuous material supply that your equipment uh, runs efficiently. Um, so right now the industry is catching up, the projects are getting bigger, but the initial of is always, you can see in the top left, just use high shear mixers on, on, on the job site. Um, with these guys, uh, you, you can get probably like 45 to 60 cubic yards in a day of material. Um, and then uh, what we've done with that is we further enhanced it, made it more easier for setup. You see in the right hand on the trailer um, where you can uh, bring the mixes, they roll in and you start mixing and the material gets put in buggies. In the bottom left, this is a, a machine that they use in Switzerland right now, which is really nice about that. It's very small and compact and they use that for tunnel projects. You can go in there, you set it up. Um, you have two high shear mixes on there. You need only two people to operate it. It's, it's very efficient. There's one guy with a tablet that runs around and, and operates the machine. Um, for larger projects, uh, this is another one I'm gonna talk about a little bit more later on, which is the REITS project. Uh, they used a full automized uh, batching plant. Uh, this project, uh, you need around 120 to 150 cubic yards in a day. Um, so this uh, plant can bring a lot of material. The advantage is uh, you can also bring the raw materials in bulk. So the cement and the sand were all brought in bulk and the fibers were brought in big bags as well. So the, the next thing that's very important is the placement of the material in front of your equipment. Um, 
the, the supply must be, as I said, and keep harping on that, consistent and constant. Uh, you don't want to have the machine to stop and go. Um, and, and there's different ways on how you can transport it. For most of the projects we have done, we've used a buggy system that you can see on the top right in the project in Iowa. Um, we find it's very easy. We can get in there. We can place the material in front of the paver quite nicely. You could use ready-mix trucks as well, um, but sometimes it really depends on the project again. How is your axis? How do you get there? Are there re exposed rebars to you know, puncture any tires? Um, things like that. Um, there's different ways of how to do this. Um, what type of equipment is out there? Uh, we've used both. So you can use a regular um, air screed for consolidation. Um, this machine, we use it more for smaller projects. Um, we have restric restricted access, not like for maybe for a single lane. You know, you use this for two lane width uh, overlays. Um, you're very restrictive in this machine because it's very light. Um, um, the vibration is not controlled. Um, you drag it. Um, it's, uh, the material usually builds up in front of it, the machine right in here. Um, so it's not enough weight there to push it down and move it. And uh, it can be challenging on steeper slopes um, because you want to have a stiffer material and if you don't have the weight. This one here is set up right. Uh, you can see that uh, it's, it's on the railings. But we've seen many times uh, other contractors take a screen and rest it on the form. So all of the vibration goes right into the form and it's not going actually in the overlay. It's just something to be aware of. Um, we've been using a lot a thin lift uh, UHPC overlay paver. Um, this equipment uh, works very well. It can set up from eight feet up to 30 feet wide. Uh, we can do up to 200 feet an hour. Um, it's adjustable hydraulic legs. It can put a crown in. It can work with the slopes. It can work with a stiffer mix and can get a nice finish um, and it's self-propelled. It's very uniform. You get proper consolidation and uh, it is a very fast method of placing a UHPC overlay. Curing is very important. Um, after the material has been placed, you need proper curing. So right now in North America, what we do is uh, we apply, apply first curing compounds to make sure that there's no dehydration and then the plastic sheeting has been put on top after that. That really helps to ensure you have proper curing. Um, You've seen other people that are just, uh, the industry is further developing on it, that they're going to use just a curing compound, um, which is great because it's, it's much easier, much simpler. But again, for these type of applications, you always have to watch out for what's the temperature out there, what's the wind and the relative humidity for your curing. We also use a lot of maturity meters. We can see that in the bottom right there, um, which is very nice because what's very important for us, when can you get the grinding and grooving on? Right now, most of the overlays require 11,000 um, PSI before you can get on uh, for grinding and grooving. So putting, uh, knowing the maturity and the strength development of your overlay is essential because then you can say, well, now we can hit it. We can go ahead and grind and groove. Um, Surface finish, this is what you can see. It's, uh, you can get a very beautiful ride, um, very smooth. Um, top left is the grinding machine that comes in and then and the bottom left, sorry. And then the top right is your grooving machine. I just wanna put a little plug out there for our work that we do at ACI 239D. We're working on a guide on materials and construction methods, and particularly chapter nine is really focusing on the methods of construction, replacement, placement, post-placement. We have a lot of people from the industry that got together um, to do that. Already two minutes. All right. So we got to get to the videos because that's the fun stuff. <laughs> the, uh, I thought I had 20 minutes. The, uh, for the Delaware Memorial Project uh, was one which is very exciting. This is the very first project, uh, um, the very largest project right now that has done, was a pilot project. We completed that in 2020. For this project, we, uh, you had to, the Delaware, Delaware River Bay Authority, DRBA, brought this out for um, validating it um, to, to try UHPC overlays because they know if the entire bridge gets done at once the first time, there's going to be a lot of challenges. So they wanted to do this project to learn a lot from it. 
And we were the successful um, subcontractor for installing a thousand feet of UHPC overlay on three different sections, the suspension span, the truss span, and the girder span. And for this project, the total of a three and a quarter UH, uh, of the deck was removed at 25 and a half feet wide. Um, the project was so successful, um, we actually had to do 90 cubic yards in an eight hour shift um, for this project. I would like to elaborate a bit more on it, but we uh, run out of time. For this project, um, um, we, we, the owner was very particular that you can only go from joint to joint to joint. Um, so that it makes it very challenging um, to be able to place the 90 cubic yards in an hour, which we did. Project was so successful that we're happy to announce now that we are the successful general contractor for the new project that's coming out that's just got awarded now at the beginning of this year. This will be the largest UHPC placement in the United States. This will be the largest UHPC overlay. It's a $71 million project. It's going to be completed in three phases. We're going to kick it off uh, Labor Day 22. Uh, you're going to have around 4,700 cubic yards of UHPC which is more than just uh, maybe the industry does in one year. <laughs> um, it's a two inch overlay, which has changed uh, it, with some adjustments were done. Um, the, the center line joint got more simplified um, and uh, we use our learnings from the first phase and particularly we're gonna, you're gonna see there's gonna be some adjustments how we mix, we transfer and place the material. Pretty excited, we're planning as we speak right now um, to minimize all the risks. So stay tuned on that project, which will happen. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about it at ACI later this fall. And then I just talk about briefly the other project my Swiss colleagues have done, um, which was completed in 2021, which was a $25 million Swiss franc project. It was a viaduct in Reeds in the, in the south of, Fran of Switzerland. Uh, for this project, the total of 2,200 cubic yards UHPC were placed. I'm sorry, three meters, that was Mr. Type on my end. And uh, what was here for this project, you can see in the picture here, on-site batching, um, construction method was slightly different what we've done in North America. Um, the material was transferred in buggies, brought over to the site, placed in front of the paving and uh, into a bucket of, a, of an excavator and then um, placed in front of the paver. That's kind of like the slides I have. I have a couple of videos. I can show them afterwards. Um, so it's right on time. But uh, you know, so, so this project is the, uh, the, the video that we're going to have here is from my Swiss colleagues. And uh, again, it's a uh, size of the project is uh, 2,100 cubic meters, which is uh, half the size of the building. Good. <laughs> sound, I guess. <laughs>
dispatch. Okay. Okay. Switzerland. <laughs>